Well, a very warm welcome to our online service on this 29th of November. It's Advent Sunday today as well. We're really glad that you have joined us. In a short while, we will light the first candle on our Advent wreath. But first, I wanted to uh, give a warm welcome to Reverend John Freeman, who's going to be preaching for us today. John is curate at Greyfriars Church, and he preached a little earlier in the year for us. But since then, he and his wife, Steph, have had a little girl called Molly, who is 10 weeks old. So thank you, John. And um, he's going to be concluding our sermon series in the book of Micah with Micah's words about our God of compassion, a God of turnaround. Well, Advent starts today and Advent is the beginning of the church's year, a time of expectation and preparation, a time when we, of course, prepare for Christmas, celebrating Christ's first coming, but also when we look ahead to his second coming, when the Lord Jesus will come as judge at the end of time. And so Advent has a penitential aspect to it as well. In Micah 7, we read these words. Because I have sinned against him, I will bear the Lord's wrath until he pleads my case and upholds my cause and brings me into the light. And therefore, in the light of Christ, our Saviour, we're going to confess our sins together now. Please do, do, do join in if you'd like to, and the responses will be on the screen below. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you have created a universe of light. Forgive us when we return to darkness. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you are the light of the world. Cleanse and heal our blinded sight. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Holy Spirit, you give us light in our hearts. Renew us in faith and love. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive you your sins, open your eyes to God's truth, strengthen you to do God's will and give you the joy of his kingdom through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, before we sing our beautiful Advent hymn, we're going to light the first candle on the Advent wreath. And a huge thanks to Enid Roberts for making it. Each candle, as you probably know, represents a Sunday in Advent and the fifth we light um, on Christmas Day. And each candle has its own meaning or theme. And this first week, we remember the patriarchs. So Abraham, our father in the faith, and King David, Jesus' ancestor, in whose city Jesus was born. So we light our first candle now. God of Abraham and Sarah, and all the patriarchs of old, you are our Father too. Your love is revealed to us in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of David. Help us in preparing to celebrate his birth, to make our hearts ready for your Holy Spirit to make his home among us. We ask this through Jesus Christ, the light who is coming into the world.
God is love. Pretty simple, really, because God gives us perfect love freely. Perfect love in the shape of a cross means my wrongs get crossed off. He gave up his crown, came down from above to do what we couldn't. That is gospel good news. That is perfect love. But to do life in Christ who paid our fee is to do life like Christ who set us free. That means the perfect love that we see in spirit strength we do, we be Christ-like. Do you think God calls us to the sidelines of church to just take a seat, shake the preacher's hand and leave, the next Sunday comes round and repeat? Do me a favour. That mindset is way out. We're called to do and show the world what perfect love's all about. He's the wellspring of life, the living water. And it's about time we be church, show love and do gospel. Not just to tick annual plan and meeting boxes, but 24, 365 and a quarter. And because the tomb is empty, perfect love's already won. But till he returns in glory, there's plenty jobs to do and to be done. See, perfect love commissions us to ricochet his love, to display Corinthians 13 love. So the mission is not just to spectate, but do. But here's the thing. God's not just calling someone else to do his gospel. In fact, He's calling you. Today's reading is from Micah, chapter 7, verses 7 to 10, and then 14 to 20. But as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God my Saviour. My God will hear me. Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Because I have sinned against him, I will bear the Lord's wrath until he pleads my case and establishes my right. He will bring me out into the light. I will see his righteousness. Then my enemy will see it and will be covered with shame. She who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will see her downfall. Even now she will be trampled underfoot like mire in the streets. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your inheritance, which lives by itself in a forest in fertile pasture lands. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in days long ago. As in the days when you came out of Egypt, I will show them my wonders. Nations will see and be ashamed, deprived of all their power. They will lay their hands on their mouths and their ears will become deaf. They will lick dust like a snake, like creatures that crawl on the ground. They will come trembling out of their dens. They will turn in fear to the Lord our God and will be afraid of you. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgressions of the remnant of his inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You will be true to Jacob and show mercy to Abraham as you pledged on oath to our fathers in days long ago. Amen. Second reading for today is from the Gospel of St John, starting at verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, 
so that it may be seen plainly what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Amen. Well, good morning, St. John's. It's wonderful to be with you digitally again. Thank you for having me back. I'm thrilled to be able to uh, help you finish your series in the book uh, of Micah. For those of you who I don't know, my name is John. I'm one of the curates at Greyfriars in Reading. I'm, I'm here with my daughter just off camera. You might hear her chirp at various points, but she's just joining in and happy to be here as well. Before we jump into our reading for today, why don't we just pray together? Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for your word. God, thank you that you use it to speak life to us. And God, I want to pray that it would be so this morning and that you give us ears to hear all that is you want to say. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I love a good twist in the story. Do you? I wonder if you do as well. You know, I love that moment where it seems like everything is going wrong. All hope has been lost. Our heroes are facing certain defeat. And then suddenly something happens. Something changes. And the prospects of the story turn around. I'm reading uh, The Lord of the Rings at the moment, and spoiler alert for a 65-year-old uh, book, but I've just read that bit where, uh, against all hope, Gandalf returns from death uh, to, to join again with our heroes in the fight towards victory. And we get this great line from him. He says this, he says, We meet again at the turn of the tide. He comes back and it's a moment of turnaround. And you know, I think God loves a good twist as well. I think God loves that moment where against all odds, against our wildest hopes, he turns our situations around. He, he takes death and he brings life. He takes hopelessness and he brings hope. He takes our sin and he gives us his righteousness. And we see that, I think, in our two readings this morning. In fact, I want to suggest to you that our God is the God of turnaround. And no matter what sin hangs over your life, no matter what dark place you find yourself lost in, no matter the mistakes you've made, God can take your brokenness. God can take my brokenness and God can take the brokenness of those we we love and care for and are worried about and he can turn our situations around. Our God is the God of turnaround. And to make sure I'm just not making this all up, let's turn together to the passages that we just had read for us where I think we see this. Because in verse Eight, Micah is prophesying to the enemies of Jerusalem and he's warning them not to be too happy, to not get ahead of themselves, to not be too boastful in what it looks like to them is their victory over God's people. You see, God's people had fallen flat on their face. They were lost in the dark and it seems for them as if all hope is lost. But Micah knows differently. Micah knows that God is the God of turnaround and that he's going to turn this situation on its head. It says, though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Micah is prophesying of the complete turnaround of Jerusalem's fortunes as God steps in. But before we get there, before we get to the turnaround, I want to just spend a moment thinking with you about enemies. Because Jerusalem was facing enemies, both internal and external. But I want to suggest to you this morning that you and I are facing enemies as well. But they're not flesh and blood. They're not other people, as Paul says in Ephesians, but they're powers and principalities. And a part of those powers arrayed against us is the power of sin. Sin, our great enemy. 
It's that power, that stain, that virus that causes and results from our disobedience to God, our turning away from him and going in our own direction. Genesis 4 describes sin, this enemy, like a predator. It says, sin is crouching at your door. It's waiting to destroy you. The author John Mark Comer describes sin as unforgiving and merciless, petty and cruel. Sin is out to get you. And the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So maybe this morning you're aware of your sin. You're aware of the places you've gone wrong, the the areas of your life where you've gone astray, the brokenness in your own soul. Maybe you know about all of that, or maybe you don't. Maybe you don't like this idea. Maybe this idea is new for you. Whether you're aware or not, the Bible says sin is your enemy. It is crouching at your door, ready to destroy you and to gloat over your defeat. And so what are we to do? Well, let's jump ahead to verses 18 and 19 in Micah for the good news. It says this, Who is God like you? who pardons sin and forgives transgression. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You know, the consistent witness of the Bible from beginning to end, from the first page to the last, is that our God, the God of turnaround, is a God who is eager to forgive sins. He's eager eager to pardon us when we turn away from his rule and reign. He's eager to forgive us when we wrong him and we wrong his children. And I love the way that Micah describes God's willingness to forgive us. Because it's not just an easy sorry that some of us have probably been guilty of offering. It's not just a sorry, don't worry about it. But really, that hurt, that pain, that sin still goes with us. It's still in the backdrop. No, no, with God, Micah tells us our sin is utterly dealt with and got rid of. He destroys it underfoot, Micah says. And then he hurls it away to a place that it can never come back and never bother us again. And so do you want to know what God's biggest turnaround is? Do you want to know the greatest twist in the story? No matter how far wrong you've gone, no matter the terrible mistakes in your past or in your present, no matter how far away from God you feel, or maybe the person that you love and worry for, that you hold in your heart and you're worried that they're distant from God, no matter how far away from God they might be, no sin, no power, no enemy is too great for our God to defeat. There's nothing we can do that he's not ready and willing and eager to forgive. He's ready and waiting to turn our stories around. And so how is he going to do it? Well, John 3 sets that out for us. This famous verse. For God so loved the world. This is the way in which God loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And listen to this. That whoever, whoever, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. If you're lost, if you're broken, if sin is crouching at your door and it's ready to destroy you, then God is ready and waiting and willing and eager to turn your life around, to 
forgive you. He simply says, come, believe in me, trust in me, turn to me, follow me. And Jesus says when we do that, we'll find life, good life, abundant life, eternal life for our hearts and our souls and our minds and our bodies. And so the invitation of turnaround is for you and it's for the person that you love and you wish would know God's turnaround. This invitation is for you and it's for today. And so would you come to Jesus? Would you turn to him? Would you trust in him? And would you experience his turnaround and find life? If you want it, if you know you need it, then I'm going to pray. And why don't you pray with me? And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the God of turnaround. God, thank you that no matter the enemies that we face, no matter the sin in our own hearts, no matter the mistakes we have made, that there's no wrong that's too big, there's no distance that's too far, that if we would just turn to you, you would forgive us. And so, Lord, I pray that for my brothers and sisters to who you've shown such kindness as to reveal to them, as I've been speaking, in their hearts and in their minds, their own brokenness, their own sinfulness. God, to those you've shown that, God, I pray that you'd give them courage and power now to turn around, to turn to you, to repent of their sins and say sorry and to trust in you. God, would you give them the strength to do that? And as they do that, would they find life? And Lord, I'm aware that it will also be people who are listening to me now who, perhaps as well as for themselves, that this burdens them for for someone else, a child or a friend or a, a colleague. God, we know people who we we just wish would would have their lives turned around, would find forgiveness in you. And so, God, we dare to pray for more than we might even ask or imagine, that you would turn around the stories of those that we love, that by your spirit at work in their hearts, you'd lead them to repentance and faith. And God, for all of us, as we come to you, we praise you, we thank you, We await and long for your forgiveness, knowing we'll find it. And we commit ourselves to you again. We pray all these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. But he brought me in Oh, his love for me Oh, his love for me Who the sun sets free Oh, it's free indeed I'm a child of God Yes, I am Free at last he ransom his grace runs deep while I was a slave to sin Jesus died for me yes he died for me
let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your deep and unchanging love. We know you understand that our questions and fears often mean that we don't live as you would want. Help us let our guard down to give you our tears and pain, to allow you to heal us through them and take us forward. We thank you for the new vaccines and ask for a fair and efficient system of availability across the world and for your support and guidance of all in positions of leadership in these difficult times. As we approach a very different Christmas, we ask that people will abide by the necessary restrictions. But above all, we pray that remembering the raw simplicity of the first Christmas will prompt us to see your birth into humanity in a new and deeper way and help us to show you to our community. We ask for your strength and protection for all those who work to bring relief and stability to those in need, whether caring for the sick or disadvantaged, for social workers, voluntary organisations. Especially, we pray for those caring for their loved ones at home. For those who are ill or going through treatment, whether new or long term, and those coming to the end of that journey and those mourning the loss of a loved one. Lord, we plead for your Holy Spirit to give courage, comfort, and above all, your peace. We gather our prayers together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. Well, thank you, Cynthia, for leading us in our prayers. As we end, just uh, a few brief notices. Well, as you'll be aware, lockdown ends on Wednesday, but then we are entering into tier two, so things will remain quite restrictive. However, the good news is that we will be opening up church again for worship on Wednesdays and Sundays and that will be starting from Sunday the 6th of December. To keep us all safe, uh, previous restrictions on singing will still apply, masks will need to be worn and there will be physical distancing too. Bookings will also be needed for track and trace. On Sunday the 6th of December, however, our first Sunday back, we will be having an all-age Advent service, which um, in person, in church, for all the families. So, that will be um, a joyous occasion, so please do join us if you are able. We have um, made in this last week the difficult decision to have our Christmas carol service online only this year. I am sorry for that, um, but without being able to sing, having carols will be uh, very difficult. However, our online service will be very special. There will be lots of carols to sing from the comfort of your ho own home. And uh, like our Remembrance Sunday service, we will involve the community and we will, we will stream it at a set time. Um, and that will be Sunday the 20th of December at five o'clock. Afterwards, we will gather at six o'clock on Zoom for a time of chat with mince pies. You'll have to bring your own and hopefully we can all wear our colourful Christmas jumpers. We will produce DVDs for those who are not online so that they can also watch that special service. A separate uh, 
letter will be sent out um, in the next few days with all the services uh, listed over the Christmas period and up until January. So do join us um, at the end of this service at 11.30 for coffee and chat on Zoom. It's lovely every week uh, to see those who join. Um, the link is on the website. Uh, it's very easy just to click through. So if you haven't joined us before, do please come and say hello. And so as we end our service, a final prayer of blessing as Advent begins. May Christ the sun of righteousness shine upon you, scatter the darkness from before your path and make you ready to meet him when he comes again in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you now and all whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen. As we await our coming Saviour, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.